All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Today, our research fellows will put the lights on uh, India, a country uh, that is deeply affected by the pandemic, as you know, and we'll look at different trends for this country and for different commodities, from crude oil to iron ore and coal. Today, we have with us Alexandre Lauer, uh, Homayun Falak Shahi, and Kevin Wright in Singapore. We'll let the guys uh, start the presentation, and I wish you all a good webinar. Thank you very much, Artur, uh, and welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us this afternoon, or this morning if you're in, uh, in Europe. As you know, Kepler has hosted about 12 webinars over the last year, and typically we've looked across the commodity space. We've done webinars on crude, we've done webinars on LNG, we've looked at LPG, we've looked at clean products. But we felt it was appropriate at this time to look at a specific market and a specific country, namely India, given the fact that it's been so heavily impacted by the ongoing second wave of coronavirus. And I just wanted to, whilst sort of accepting that this situation and these statistics are tragic, I just wanted to make sure that we're all aware of the sort of the current situation within India itself and how new cases continue to spread. As we know, there are 17.9 million cases uh, across the country. The number goes up every day. It's, in, it's increasing by in excess of 350,000 new cases per day, and there have been over 200,000 deaths in total across the country. It's affected primarily the major population centres around Mumbai and Delhi and the, and the large population states of Gujarat and West Bengal, but it's now starting to spread into the rural, uh, rural India, rural economy, and starting to spread into villages. Clearly, the impact has been felt already in the commodity space, but what we want to look at today is how the how the Indian market is going to respond, how it's being affected right now. And that's going to be in terms of coal, LNG, iron ore, crude. Then we're going to look at the clean products uh, angle, see what's happening with refineries in terms of domestic demand and also exports. And then we're going to finish by looking at LPG and the wider sort of impacts on GDP. So in order to get us all started, to get us kicked off this afternoon, I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's going to start by looking at coal. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so yes, uh, on, on the dry bulk uh, side, we will start with uh, with the coal, which is probably the most important to focus on, on the dry bulk, as the country heavily uh, rely on it for uh, power generation. So as a reminder, uh, the state-owned enterprise Coal India is the largest coal mining company in the world, and the coal sector is a major source of revenues for the government. And, and as we, we saw early March, so more than a month ago, the country is continuing to invest in coal as highlighted with the new investment of more than $6 billion on mining projects, which will add 200 million tons um, a year. As a result, uh, in March this year, while coal accounts for 53% of installed capacity in power generation, it actually generates 77 percent of power again in March, while it's usually a little bit lower, around 70 uh, percent. Any so that means that any lower growth of the economy will have a significant or had a significant impact on coal import, as it was actually the case uh, last year during the first wave of COVID. And we can see that on the chart, lower industrial production pushed coal import at 6.7 million ton, tons at the lowest, which was less than a half compared to, compared to 2019. So demand recovered as from July last year and accelerated in the second part of the year as there was less cases and as well, uh, no more lockdown. Right now in Q1 uh, of this year, the import was still 30% lower if we compare to a year ago, despite the rebound of the economy and before the current lockdown in uh, some uh, regions. But we know that the first indication on the industrial production in April suggests that coal import should be lower in the coming weeks. And in our view, we could come back to the record low we saw uh, last year, around 6 million tons of uh, imports. 
Indonesia will clearly be the most hit as uh, the export uh, represents 50% of imported coal uh, for uh, India, followed by South Africa and Australia in a lesser extent around 20%. But more generally, and as a conclusion of uh, this slide, not only India and Indonesia will be impacted on the coal side, but the global coal market will could be, as said, India account for 18% percent of global coal uh, import. Power generation is also generated by natural gas, and that's uh, what we will uh, look on the next slide. So as you, as you probably know, the country is the fourth largest importer of LNG, and it had nearly doubled its capacity of the last uh, 10 years. But despite of that, natural gas only accounts for 6% of the energy mix. As mentioned uh, earlier, the key reason of this mix is clearly linked to economics decided by the government and as uh, it had a big advantage for the country to stay on coal. Uh, also, it's worth uh, mentioning that the growth of LNG had been driven not only by growing consumption, but as well by declining domestic natural gas uh, production uh, in, um, in India. In terms of uh, supplier, Qatar is the main one, uh, of course, for a, a very easy, uh, simple reason, as the transportation distance is very short. It only takes uh, three days to join uh, Qatar to India. But LNG imports from uh, the United States have grown, and it's right now, since the beginning of the year, the second supplier for uh, India. In the short term, and as we highlighted uh, on the chart here, um, India uh, is pretty more a price taker when it comes to LNG, willing to buy more natural gas when pricing are low, and therefore increasing exposure to spot, car spot cargoes, as we highlight here on the, on the chart. So the current situation so far, what we are seeing on the, on the, on the platform, is that there have been four LNG carriers that were diverted since uh, the 20th of uh, April, three of them to Europe, one uh, in the Middle East. Bottom line, uh, we already see, because of this diversion, some impact on the LNG market in, uh, in India. But the importance uh, of the country on the, glo on the global market on LNG is relatively small as the country only account for 6% of the LNG uh, import. So it's much less important than coal, but we have here a trend. We have a kind of similar pattern when it comes to iron ore, as we cover it on uh, this slide. So just as a reminder, you, you, you know that uh, iron ore market is driven by, by China, and that for China, Australia is a key um, supplier. So Australia remained the largest source of feed for China steel with around 60%. Uh, but of course, the ongoing tension between the two countries have alarmed the iron ore and steel uh, industry uh, in China, and it accelerated the diversification. The second uh, major supplier is Brazil, but Brazil, as you know, has been struggling as well uh, with uh, COVID infection in its mining uh, sector. So when we speak about diversification for China, Indian is uh, one of the solutions. And it has been, uh, for India, this situation has been beneficiary. As you can see on the chart, Indian exports reached a record high in March, and almost all that export went to China. It has been 88 persons. But for China, still, India remains small, because it only accounts for 5% of its uh, import. So in addition to a strong demand uh, from China, another explanation of that increase of export could be lower domestic consumption uh, in, uh, in, in India, meaning more iron ore available to export. Keep in mind that uh, higher iron ore prices in the last few months create tension in India between miners and steel makers willing to ban export uh, as also iron ore production decreased in India in uh, 2020. 
So all in all, what we say, what we're saying here is that lower domestic demand is uh, expected in India with the current situation, and that could mean higher export or at least staying at a relatively high level uh, in the coming uh, weeks. So the situation, as you see on the bulge, is different from one uh, commodity to the other, but clearly the coal uh, is potentially having the biggest impact on the uh, global market. Then if we move to the liquid side, we'll see that it's probably also the case on uh, the oil side. So let's start to, to, uh, to see uh, when we speak about crude oil imports, what happened uh, during the first wave of COVID uh, last year. So if we focus on the chart, you can see that as from April 2020, the country cut its import by 14% compared to the previous month, so March, and reached a low uh, in July at 3.2 million bar per day of imports. And that was basically 30% lower compared to, compared to 2019. The second part of the year, of course, was much better, with imports reaching 95% of pre-COVID level and even higher uh, in March of this year, as there has been a record uh, high on gasoline uh, consumption. Keep in mind that for 2020, the oil demand in India was down 0.5 million bar per day. Just to mention here, uh, public refineries were the first to cut, that's in orange, that's what you can see here, were the first to cut their imports as from April last year, as it better reflects the domestic uh, consumption, despite the fact that they used some of that uh, uh, oil imported to increase the SPR, while on the private side, the private payers are more reliant on the international uh, market. So the question is, yeah, to what extent the current situation uh, may impact in an oil import and also the global demand of uh, crude oil. So if we look, if we if we want to compare what happened last year, we can easily we could easily see a one million bar per day lower imports for a couple of weeks in a row, especially as there is no more room for storage. For storage. As you may uh, know, and that's something we'll discuss on the, the next slide, Indian crude oil storage capacity is uh, limited, meaning that uh, when there is a demand restriction, refiners must cut their import quickly. So here the key figure is to keep in mind that the second wave of COVID could easily represent a, 0 .2, a 200 kVD of demand destruction for 2021. And on this um, slide, where we focused on, um, on the storage, we wanted to highlight that uh, the, a year ago, the government took the opportunity to increase its uh, SPR, that's what you can see in orange, by 20 uh, million bars, which um, led to a longer waiting time to discharge as shown at the bottom of the, of the chart in, uh, in green while on the commercial storage, which is at the top of the slide, it has been quite stable over recent years, uh, fluctuating between 60 and uh, 80 uh, million. So far, and uh, as we expected, there is no sign of any increase in storage, either on floating storage or inland, as highlighted by the low average waiting time to discharge. Again, that's in green at the bottom of the, the chart. Keep in mind that unlike China, which has 10 times more storage capacity and was able to increase its import significantly during a low oil price, this is not the case of India as there were no political strategy to invest, also thanks to their geographical situation, which is well uh, connected to, uh, to uh, Middle East. But as demand has been increasing years after year, uh, the country is more and more sensitive to oil price movement, especially on the, uh, on the upside as a consumer. And that has been highlighted by the involvement of the Indian Petroleum Ministry during uh, OPEC uh, meeting. So what is important here is that the country is looking for short-term solutions like increasing floating storage of, or diversifying its supply. So it has not to rely on Middle East uh, crude. This move come at a time where India perception is that oil price have been moving higher because of successive decisions by OPEC driven by uh, Saudi 
Arabia. And that's uh, what we see on the, on the next slide. So as I mentioned, the, the petroleum uh, minister has urged um, refiners to speed up diversification of crude and reduce dependence on Middle East uh, goals. Keep in mind that India imports 84% of its oil needs with 60% coming from a Middle Eastern country. And thanks to improvement in the, in the whole global shipping value chain, Indian refiners have access to multiple sources of oil that mitigate any unnecessary premium on, uh, on crude oil. So as we can see here on the, on the, on the chart, there are three, three countries. India has already reduced its dependency on Saudi Arabia. Last month, the U.S. has been sending more oil to India than Saudi Arabia. That, was been, that has been the first time ever. It was with uh, uh, 600,000 um, barrels per day. Uh, we also had some um, uh, increase from, uh, from other countries, but in a, in a lesser extent. Uh, increased intakes from the U.S. are used uh, as a lever to, pu to push Middle East producers to lower, actually, the official uh, setting price. Last uh, but not least, as you can see on the, on the chart in the green uh, color, Indian, India is keen to import Iranian oil as uh, former refinery were historically uh, designed to take Iranian uh, crude. The import average between 0 0.5 and 0 0.7 million barrels per day before the U.S. were re-implementing the sanctions. So here, there is some potential for the country to uh, take Iranian oil if Iran uh, is exporting again. So now that we, we spoke about the, the, the crude oil market, it's also interesting to have a look on the product side. And I will hang over to Kevin again to uh, cover this part. Thank you very much, Alex, for that very comprehensive picture of what's happening on dry bulks, what's happening on LNG, and obviously what's happening on crude. And as you say, I'm going to switch now across the refining complex uh, in order to look at the clean products picture. And the first thing to note on this chart uh, is the orange line at the top, and this is the demand for transport fuel. So this is consumption of gasoline and diesel, and diesel uh, in India over the last couple of years. And what we can see quite clearly, as we mentioned earlier, is as a result of the lockdown in April of 2020, demand was hit very, very hard. And that carried on through the second and third quarters. And it was actually only in October where we had the first signs of any real recovery. October was the first month where gasoline demand in India was back to pre-COVID levels. So we started to see signs that potentially, you know, the lockdown was easing, India was starting to come out the other side. Obviously, we didn't know how it was going to develop and to the situation that we currently face. Now, at the same time as that demand destruction, as Alex mentioned just a moment ago, in terms of crude oil imports, there was an impact on refinery throughput. And if we look at the second or the lower half of this slide, we can see refinery throughput for the state-owned sector and also for the private sector. And looking specifically at the public sector first, we can see that they had to, those state-owned refineries had to respond very quickly to that demand destruction. And it's only now that we're seeing a recovery in those throughput levels. It's too early to say what will happen in April and what will happen in May and the rest of the second quarter. But for February, March, well, well sorry, for February and March, we certainly seem to be recovering towards where we were pre-COVID. Turning back to the top half of this slide and looking at the blue chart, or the blue bars on the chart rather, which represent exports. And this is really the activity of surplus for the private refining sector. So this is Reliance and Nayara on the west coast of India. And we can see that exports were severely dented. And this was really as a result of arbitrage economics around the world, simply not favoring specifically gas oil to Northwest Europe and gasoline to the US, simply not favoring exports. So the refiners trimmed their runs and exports were reduced. One bright spot that we've got on this chart is towards the very uh, right extreme of the slide, the, the, the blue bar for March, which shows a sudden increase in exports. And this is as a result of very strong US gasoline refining margins. Arbob versus NYMEX WTI cracks have hit 22, 23, and even $24 a barrel in the last few months. And that has encouraged refiners to start exporting again. So we've seen that in March. Now, when we turn to our next slide, 
what we thought would be interesting would be to look at the destination of those clean product exports. And starting from the bottom of this chart, taking the light green bars, they represent west of Suez. So that's a, a region within our methodology that covers Northwest Europe, it covers the Americas, but also importantly, it covers West Africa. And what we can see is that as the arbitrage on gas oil in particular and gasoline that I mentioned just a moment ago, really closed, the amount of export that was happening, that was taking place and going towards Northwest Europe and, and the US in particular fell quite starkly. Q4 of 2019, 462,000 barrels a day were heading west of Suez. And by Q4 of 2020, that number was down to 202,000 barrels a day. So a very drastic reduction in the overall level of, of export to that region. Now, one sort of bright spot that I mentioned just a moment ago is West Africa. Uh, and over the course of the, the final part of Q4 and into Q1, West Africa has seen an increase in barrels from India, specifically diesel and gasoline, but also some jet. Uh, and to put that into perspective, We've seen 155,000 barrels a day in February and 145,000 barrels a day in March against an average of just 42,000 barrels per day in 2019 and 2020. Now, why is this happening? Well, simply put, refiners in the east of Suez, including India, the Mideast Gulf, Taiwan, Korea, China, etc., when the arbitrage is closed to other regions such as Northwest Europe, they have to look within their own region for outlets. And that's, that has effectively benefited West Africa, and it's also benefited some of the other regions around, around Asia, in particular, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, uh, which is shown here in the dark green bars, uh, has benefited from effectively closed arbitrage and a surplus of product across the region. Refineries in particular in the Philippines, first of all, had their uh, runs trimmed, and then finally were closed. And those refineries turned to the product import markets rather than turning to crude markets and refining themselves. So we saw that level of import from India also benefit uh, from those, that set of circumstances. At the same time, the light blue bars, which represent um, exports to the Middle East, uh, have also fallen. And this is due to a couple of factors. The first, which, first of which is obviously the global impact of lockdowns. People have been driving less, industrial activity has been curtailed. Therefore, you would expect generally lower consumption, goes without saying. But what's happened around the Middle East is we've also seen a lower level of export from the Middle East to its traditional arbitrage outlets like Northwest Europe because of unfavorable economics. That has meant a rebalancing of the surpluses around that region. And as a result, we've seen lower imports required from India. Another aspect is, and just giving you an example here, the de-bottlenecking that happened at the Persian Gulf Star Refinery in Iran in the middle of last year. That refinery now produces in excess of 300,000 barrels per day of gasoline. So that clearly also has had an impact on India's exports to the Middle East. Turning our attention now to LPG, a very important fuel within the Indian domestic and uh, household environment. Over the last several years, we've had a very strong government mandate towards increasing the domestic use of LPG. So this is for heating, for cooking, uh, and as I say, for, for household usage. And that's really been supported by government mandate in the form of subsidies. They've encouraged Indian households in the rural areas to move away from their traditional fuels of wood or even dried animal manure. And as a result, taking, uh, taking those noxious fume generating fuels out of the home and replacing them with LPG has meant the demand growth for LPG has been strong for at least as long as this chart goes on, for the last seven or so years. Now, as I mentioned a few moments ago, and as Alex pointed out as well, we've seen lower throughput through the refineries over the course of 2020, but we've still had this strong demand for LPG. You don't run a refinery on the basis of LPG economics. You run a refinery on the basis of your diesel or your gasoline economics, and LPG is very much a byproduct. Well, with the LPG demand staying strong, LPG uh, India has had to increase its imports over the course of the last year. And you can see that towards the right hand side in the blue bars on this chart. Now, something that's, that's uh, a fly in the ointment for this story in the coming months is that the subsidies that the Indian government put in place are stopping right now. They're actually stopping in April 2021. That was announced back in November to a bit of a, a furore amongst the public and to a bit of a storm. But the long term impact of that is yet to be seen. But I think it's fairly certain to say there will be a dent in demand as the poorest people in India are unable to afford LPG when it's not subsidized. 
Okay, we're going to move on now to look at a few conclusions from today, but also before we do that, just to have a quick look at the sort of the wider GDP situation that exists right now. And this chart is plotting forecasted current quarter growth with the blue dots against actual achieved GDP growth uh, on a year on year basis. And the key thing to note within with, with this slide and with this chart is that India, Indian GDP growth has not exceeded expectations since the first quarter of 2018. And in fact, has only met them uh, in the second quarter of 2018, didn't actually exceed them. The only time when it has exceeded them was when the expectations were incredibly bearish, were incredibly pessimistic in the third and fourth quarters of 2020. So what this chart is showing us is, is, is that India over the last three or four years has consistently underperformed. COVID was not the start of the rot. Obviously, it hasn't helped in any way, shape or form. But COVID was not the, was not the reason for this underachievement by the Indian economy. What's caused it fundamentally is underdevelopment and underinvestment in infrastructure. So transportation to get raw goods in and to get finished product out. Now, in the course of looking at the GDP growth picture for India in the last week or so, I came across an interesting piece of research that says that smaller companies in India actually contribute 25% of India's GDP and 40% of its manufacturing output. Now, those companies have been hit very, very hard by COVID simply because their balance sheets, their cash flows, etc., are not as strong as those of their larger counterparts. As a result, when revenue started to fall, those, com those smaller companies felt the pinch. They had to let go of staff more quickly. They potentially had to even cease operation altogether. So this situation that we see right now of underperformance versus expectations on GDP growth is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. So to conclude the points from our, our presentation today, and, and to sort of reflect one of the key points around GDP is to look at this uh, this chart of of oil import uh, oil demand rather within the country and you can see again 2008 was the highest in recent years 2019 a fall 2020 severely impacted by covid 2021 based on current estimates is unlikely even to to match up to the level we saw in 2017 so clearly the indian economy continues to struggle now as alex said because of the indian uh, the indian coal industry and the coal uh, the power generation industry's uh, appetite for, for feedstock, any fall in Indian coal means a drop in global coal demand. And that could actually be impacted by 5 to 10% in the second quarter of this year. While because of its size and because of its, um, sco uh, its scope or scale within the energy mix, there should be limited impact on LNG. Iron ore exports are expected to remain high as lower domestic demand gives more room for Indian producers to export, <clears throat> excuse me, especially to China as it looks for an alternative to Australia. Low crude storage capacity is pressuring India, and we could see further imports from outside of, of OPEC. So we saw the US picture, for example, and that's likely to continue. However, oil demand could be lowered by a full 500,000 barrels per day for the rest of the year, oh, sorry, for the full year, but we think it could actually be lowered by up to a million barrels in the coming months. Clean petroleum product demand remains threatened both locally and globally. Export economics don't work, and as a result, we're going to see lower throughput and lower exports in general. And as I mentioned just a few moments ago, LPG demand is also going to be harmed by a reduction in subsidies. So the, the rural community is going to turn back to the traditional fuels of wood and dried animal manure rather than using clean LPG. Now that completes the formal part of our presentation today. Uh, I'm going to hand the microphone back over to Artur, who's going to moderate a question and answer session. Artur. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, thank you for, for this very insightful presentation. Indeed, we have a, a few questions. Uh, by the way, I would like to mention that it's possible to ask questions in the um, Q&A um, pool box uh, at the bottom of the Zoom window. If we cannot answer those uh, questions today during this session, uh, we will answer them by email. So don't hesitate to drop questions uh, in the QA window. Uh, first question is, um, is, is the following Do you expect India product exports to recover before domestic demand doubles? I, I would assume that's a question for me, Artur, given that it's on the clean product side. Indeed. Um, 
the, the, the Indian merchant refiners, so this is Reliance and Nayara, um, are very much dependent on export economics and arbitrage to various other parts of the world, specifically uh, to Northwest Europe for diesel, for the, to North, North America for gasoline. Whereas the state-owned refiners are much more dependent on uh, domestic demand and domestic consumption. Now, given what we know about vaccination rates and case rates and so on in parts of Europe and the US, we can see that a recovery there is likely to happen more quickly than is happening right now in India. It's, it's quite well understood by epidemiologists that the caseload is going to get worse in India before, it's get, before it gets better. That may well lead to further lockdowns, which will lead to domestic demand destruction. So to answer the question simply, I think exports will recover before domestic demand does. Thank you, Kevin. And, uh, and, and stay with us for the following question. I think it's for you too. Uh, will Indian barrels continue to be consumed in Southeast Asia in the future? That's an interesting question. Um, Southeast Asia in particular, you know, based on the chart that I showed a few moments ago, has seen quite a bit of growth in Indian barrels. Um, some of that has been related to refinery rationalizations, let's call them. Uh, but some of those refinery rationalizations have actually turned into permanent shutdowns. So a couple of refineries in the Philippines in particular uh, have been converted into import terminals. On that basis, they will need to import product from somewhere. Now, the most logical place for somewhere like the Philippines to import from is South Korea, Japan, or Taiwan, just basis geography. But if, if we continue to see Indian surpluses in the market, then Southeast Asia will continue to take, you know, will continue to take barrels from, from Indian sources as well. Thank you, Kevin. Um, here is a question on coal. Um, Alex, Alex and Lauer, where is Indonesia exporting coal if they can rely on India in the coming month? Yes. Um, so let me go briefly on, on our platform because it's easy to, to, to see the detail. But uh, my guess is that the first country is probably uh, uh, China. Um, so yeah, actually, it's China. China is the first consumer of um, Indonesia. And coal is accounting for 40% so far uh, this year. So it's almost, it's almost the, the half. And they are followed by uh, India with uh, 20 person. So clearly, uh, if uh, India is dividing by two, uh, I think that um, Indonesia will heavily rely uh, on, on China uh, for that. Because after that, the other countries only account for 5%. And it's like Philippines, uh, Malaysia, and uh, Japan. So yeah, relying on, uh, on, uh, on China for Indonesia exports. We're taking two more questions. Um, the next one is this one. Alex, stay with us. You mentioned that vessels were diverted. How many did it represent on the total number of LNG vessels? So that's a move that we, we saw quite, uh, quite recently. Uh, as, uh, as mentioned, we, we had four LNG shipments that originally headed for India and have been diverted to other uh, locations since uh, the 20th of April as a result of a uh, slash of fuel demand in the, in the nation. So if we compare that to, to Mars, there has been 13 LNG shipments that arrived to uh, India. So it will represent almost a third of the total uh, shipment of, of last year. If we look in April, I can see on the platform 10 uh, shipments of uh, LNG. But there is an increasing number of uh, vessels in the in the past few days uh, that have started exhibiting floating storage behavior. So there are four uh, vessels that have been marked as uh, floating storage on our uh, Kepler uh, platform on LNG so far. Okay, um, thank you. And. Um... We'll take the last question. The last question will be this one. Um, will, we, will we expect oil imports from Saudi Arabia to recover next month? Who wants to answer these questions, guys? Uh, I'll probably uh, take it. Uh, so, Homoin speaking here. Um, so, um, as I think you probably know, um, the Indian Energy Minister mentioned the fact that they are going to decrease imports from Saudi Arabia in May. Uh, 
so we actually do not expect uh, a, a big increase from from Saudi Arabia. We we we, do, we don't really expect it to to decrease that much uh, as well because it has already uh, decreased significantly. Uh, but I think what would be interesting to watch is what happens after the the month of May, um, and the whole picture is really to be looked at. Um, under a geopolitical lens, given the fact that it seems that India uh, right now is, is trying to to kind of uh, play a bit poker with with Saudi Arabia, uh, based on the fact that you know Saudi Arabia had voluntarily decreased its production and and that has boosted oil prices according to to India. So we think that India in the short term is likely to favor other Middle Eastern suppliers such as Iraq. Uh, and in the medium term, if Iran manages to come back, if sanctions are lifted, uh, then it is also likely to displace even more uh, oil from, from Saudi Arabia. So, so we do not expect a big comeback from Saudi Arabia until at least June or July. Thank you, uh, Omayun. We'll now um, close uh, this session. Uh, the slides of this uh, presentation will be sent to you by email. Uh, the um, recording of this webinar will be available on demand uh, right after the session. Um, and uh, if you, if your question was not answered by the analyst, it will be uh, answered by email uh, in the next few days. Thank you very much for attending this uh, Kepler webinar. Thank you to the panelists, and uh, we'll see you uh, in the next one. Have a good afternoon. Have a good day. Bye.